Hi, I'm Gene Bosler. I'm in Houston, Texas. I'm on a private property. I would like to, you know, protect the the privacy of my of my client. Behind me uh, is this granddaddy, 69 and a half inches in diameter. Let me step down. Look, look at this huge root flare that I was standing on. Look at that beauty. Let me stand back so you can really get a picture of next to this trash can. It's a real big tree. Now this is a cherry bark oak, Quercus pagoda. You may argue with me and say that it's a Quercus falcata, southern red oak. I'm just going to call it a pagoda or cherry bark oak for the purposes of this discussion. It's got these big, beautiful, droopy leaves. Um, let me focus in on them so that you may study them. A lot of people might call it a turkey oak. It is not. I'm pretty sure it's not a turkey oak. I'm going to call it a cherry bark oak. Here. Now, I've been called in to provide a second opinion on this tree. It's been cared for for many years by, uh, by another outfit. And I think they've done a pretty good job of caring for it. The, the question, I believe, by the way, I believe this tree is, is on the Harris County Register of Historic Trees. If it's not, it deserves to be. It's a real granddaddy. It's a real phenomenal specimen. Um, so, this is a good example of one of the principles of uh, tree care that I harp on and on about, and it is that tree health and tree structural soundness are more or less unrelated topics. So in the case of this tree, you can see that it has a very healthy crown, good leaf population, uh, big large pieces of it having broken out, poking holes in the canopy notwithstanding, it's got a good leaf population. It's a good tree. So judging from leaf population, I would call it a healthy tree but it has some pretty serious structural defects. And the reason I came out is because on a nice, calm day, today's pretty windy, a very large piece broke out of it. Look at this decay in the center. You can also see that there's a, ca a couple of cables, there's like three cables existing in here. There's also an old lightning protection system that needs some attention. It's a double strand lightning protection system. Many of the connectors are, are disconnected and uh, that needs to be inspected. There's also an existing lighting, landscape lighting system. There's a light right there. That should be in accordance with the ANSI A300 lightning protection system standard, should be tied into the system. Um, so you can see some pretty fresh cuts were made. This one's pretty fresh. This was the big piece that broke out um, here very recently. Uh, that stub was left. I'm not sure why. For the most part, this tree was fairly well pruned by the previous outfit, and I congratulate them on their, their good judgment and, and good training on their pruning. This big piece broke off with it and is damaged. Look at that big, big ugly rip. That whole limb should really go, and I can see kind of why they left it. So this whole hole in the sky right here, from here, to here. That whole hole in the sky was was poked in it. That damage was made. So it's quite a significant, the big chunk of this tree was broken out of it. And so you can understand why the owners of this tree might be concerned. What do we do? We want to keep this tree. Can we keep it? And the question is often asked, is it going to live? And I think that's the wrong question to ask. The question is, can we manage this risk? And I say, yes, we can manage the risk, but the key to managing the risk, I'm trying to get in out of the sun so that 
there we go, see my face a little better, not that you would want to, is to keep minimized traffic underneath this tree. So let's talk about that, enough about me, and uh, I'm going to direct your attention to this path. Now this is a foot path, golf cart path, horse path, uh, lawn mower, riding mowers, and tractors, right? The good news is that there's enough real estate. I'm trying to minimize how much I show you because again I want to protect the, the privacy of my client. But this path really needs to be directed around this tree, around the drip line of the tree, and then connect back in over there. Okay. I also, you know, so I also think in, in being consistent with what a lot of other people do with their historic trees. Take for example that monster live oak in, uh, in New Braunfels, Texas in that city park there. What's that park called? Anyway, where they've got a, an iron fence around it. You know, protect the tree from people and protect people from the tree. I would come 25 radial feet out from that flare and and just put in a little decorative iron fence around this tree I, I would if this was my tree I would uh, I'd stop having functions on this platform but uh, at a minimum I would regulate its use so that instead of being everyday use I would say okay on special occasions the board approves X and X couple getting their picture taken under this tree right because this is about liability at this point. And since big pieces fell out of this tree on a very high traffic day where there were a lot of guests present, um, risk management is the name of the game. So again, you, you just see it's so impressive to walk around uh, amongst these massive roots. So uh, my recommendation is to put in a, uh, to, to conduct a root invigoration procedure even if they elect to keep these boards at a minimum, the boards need to be pulled up so we can do a root invigoration procedure uh, 25 radial feet, a massive area. You can see that this is a huge area. You want to minimize how this sand decomposed gravel is removed. Most of it, I would soak this place, get it good and wet so that it's easier to conduct the procedure and most of this is going to get worked in. Better to work it in than to come in with a blade and scrape it off because when you do so, you're going to scrape away all of those worm-like fibrous feeder roots that reside at the very surface. Now, you might argue with me saying, look, there's hardly any organic matter. The soil is severely compromised, uh, compacted. Um, I conducted some soil samples when I was here last week and I was only able to penetrate like two inches. It's really that compacted. And there's like squat for organic matter here, although there is some organic matter underneath these floorboards, as you can imagine. But I came out here into the lawn, right? And I didn't even attempt to penetrate here. But you can see what I'm trying to say is avoid any damage to surface roots, both uh, storage roots and fibrous feeder roots that are residing in that first inch. So this is going to be a labor-intensive, time-intensive project to remove the decomposed granite. And I dare say that most of it is just going to be worked in with, during the root invigoration procedure, which involves using an air spade or, or air excavation tool to air till, decompact the soil, incorporate organic matter into the, uh, into the existing soil to as great a depth as we can, given the, given the uh, that's why we want to water it in, given how, uh, how compacted this soil is. Um, my only other recommendations for this tree is, you know, um, I, some of these branches that overhang this structure, I would put some cables in here. Um, the only limiting factor might be uh, if, the, if the anchor branch where the cables are installed has any defects in it, then that might be un, uh, unfeasible. And so we might have to do some more weight reduction. But, you know, I, I congratulate the, the, the previous company who did do the weight reduction pruning after this accident because they really, they, they knew when to say when. So they quit when they did. They cleared the building. You know, they left, a, you know, they left some cuts there. And, you know, they, they said, okay, good enough. Like, here's another recent cut. 
right? And they stop there. In fact, uh, a woman who, who's been a member of this uh, organization for some decades asked me why I thought they didn't take more, and I, I, congrat I said I commend them for, for stopping where they did. Um, if you have any comments, leave them in the comment section of the YouTube video or send me an email at info at wideworldoftrees.com. I also have a voicemail hotline. Two six two seven two four sixty seven zero one. Somebody recently asked me, "What's the deal with the?" I don't even know where that area code is. If I'm in Houston, that's a G. That's my Google uh, Google voicemail. Um, uh, a couple other notes regarding this tree. This tree does need a climbing inspection. So, in addition to getting up in the tree and making needed repairs to the lightning protection system, right? In, in, uh, to stay compliant with the ANSI A300 Lightning Protection System standard. And in addition to tying it in to the existing landscape lighting wiring, we really need to, to inspect. I think that this is a massive defect. So you see that this branch is massively defective. Take a closer look, I'll give it to you. I think there's even a fissure there, right there, above it is a big old stub. This big limb has three cables going out towards it. I would turn this lawn into a zero traffic zone over here because that big limb could be the next to fall. Or this one, which has got this big break that I pointed out earlier from where this big piece broke and fell. Um, I also, this is a good example of why it's important to prune all the way back to a proper final cut and to take as much of a branch as possible. I know it's not ideal. I'd like to prune back to a lateral. Uh, the ANSI A300 pruning standard states to prune back to a lateral that's one third the diameter of the cut you're making. So for example, this branch here, they cut back to this one, which is, you know, a little bit larger than one third the diameter of the cut. So that was a proper final cut. But let me point out, hypoxylon canker, which is present on this limb here, for the first eight to 10, 12 feet of this branch, that is usually considered to be a post-mortem or saprophytic uh, pathogen that attacks dead wood. But we do see it in trees that are still alive and that's what we would consider a diseased limb. And I would recommend cutting that off there to a proper branch collar cut and, uh, and stopping there. <coughs> this is also a very diseased limb. The idea was to try to keep it intact, but they didn't really cut it back to a lateral whose diameter was one third of the, the diameter of the final cut. You, so that should have really been, and I do recommend taking it uh, back to the uh, to the trunk here. So that and this big old daddy here that just broke off a couple of weeks ago creating this hole in the sky here. Um, those are the only three cuts I would make from a pruning perspective. All the weight reduction has already been done and again for the most part I'm, uh, I'm pleased with what the previous outfit did with this tree. Thank you very much for tuning in. Again, manage me, managing risk is the key to preserving an historic tree. Arborists out there, if you get your hands on a property like this, a client like this, and you feel like you're in over your head, give me a call. Be honest with the client. Say, I haven't worked with, a, with, a, with an historic tree before, or one this big, or one with this many problems, or one with this much traffic. And don't be afraid to tell them, y'all need to minimize the traffic underneath this tree because you want to keep this tree, it's an integral part of this property, but you really need to, ma to manage the risk. So keep it healthy, but also manage risk. Thank you very kindly for tuning in.